Welcome to Digging for Truth, where we explore the historical reliability of the 66 books of the Bible. I'm your host, Henry Smith. Today our guest is Dr. Todd Bolin, founder of BiblePlaces.com and professor of Biblical Studies at the Masters University in California. Dr. Bolin's joining us to talk about Queen Esther for two episodes, and she was located in the heart of the Persian Empire at Susa. Dr. Bolin, welcome to Digging for Truth. It's great to have you on. Thank you. It's good to be with you. That's great. Uh, we're, we're glad that you're here, and uh, we appreciate your joining us all the way from uh, the left coast, as it were. That's right. Yes. Uh, it, there's there's uh, good things happening out here, but I know the reputation we have. <laughs> well, we can't get into all that today. Uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to take two episodes. In fact, you and I had some dialogue you know, talking about Queen Esther. And after reading what you shared with me, I was like, we got to do two episodes. So it should be very exciting for our audience. Um, but before we jump into the material, we do have a little time for you to share a little bit about your ministry work, uh, Bible places, and then, you know, your teaching ministry. Maybe uh, let's take some time to tell the audience about what you do. Sure. Yes, I'm a, I'm a teacher, professor. I started my career in Israel, teaching at the Extension Campus for the Master's University. And uh, as while I was doing that, I was there for 11 years teaching uh, college students traveling all over the land and taking pictures. And, and uh, just kind of the reality through some people who've asked me and sorts of things, like I, I should put together some photo collections. And uh, that was just, you know, now more than 20 years ago. And what's, what's uh, known as BiblePlaces.com. And we have photo collections started, you know, in Israel, Galilee, and and uh, then it's it's grown out even now. We have Persia and, and collections for Esther we're talking about here today and, and a lot of other biblical books. Yeah, it's great. And uh, our, some of our audience members who have watched many episodes will probably recognize the name of your website and your ministry because you've always graciously allowed us to use your photos for free for our show and for our magazine. And it's a great opportunity for me to say thank you publicly for that. We really, we really appreciate it. Oh, you're certainly welcome. And I'm just so grateful for your ministry and the way you are helping people to understand God's word in light of the archaeological record. Yeah. Now, speaking of that, we're going to we're going to get right into it because we're going to be talking about Esther here. Right. So most people know the story, you know, the the silent providential hand of God, as it were, in the story. God is not mentioned in the, in the text of Esther. But, you know, the events that are recorded there, they take us to a place that a lot of archaeologists, it's kind of off the beaten path, if you will. Uh, you know, we, we're familiar with Greece and Jordan and, and, of course, Israel and Egypt. But you're going to take us somewhere else. Uh, maybe start with the background of, of the city of Susa and the Persian Empire for us, Todd. Yes, yeah, so that, I mean, the, the heart of God's redemptive plan was in the land of Israel. I mean, that's where he, he brought Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, out of Mesopotamia, to the land of Canaan, where the Israelites lived. And so when we think about the Holy Land, we're thinking about Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And, and so, yeah, so where does Esther come in? And the answer is Esther is in exile. So after God's people had, had broken the covenant, God was patient with them for so long. but but then, you know, having spurned the prophets, the Israelites were carried off into Babylon. Now, where does Persia come in? So the, the Babylonian Empire fell. That also was, was prophesied by Jeremiah and other prophets. And, and it was conquered by, by the Persians. And Esther was one of the, the Jewish maidens living in the land of Persia when the events recorded in this book take place, where the, the, the king's wife, is going to show some disrespect, and he's going to need a new queen, and and that happens in in the city of Susa. So, uh, at this time, uh, give us a little bit more of, of sort of what's happening in that, because now, okay, so the Babylonians are gone; the Persians have have uh, conquered them. So we have this sort of like some people going back to Jerusalem. Is that right? But a lot of people staying in these foreign lands. Maybe expand on that a little bit. Yeah, exactly. So Ezra and Nehemiah tell the story of the Israelites who returned. And uh, there's several returns in there with Zerubbabel 
with, with Ezra the priest and with Nehemiah the governor. Um, and th that takes about a hundred years. That's actually recording from about 530 BC until around the time of, of Nehemiah, 440 BC. So in the middle of that, in around the year 480, we have this kind of meanwhile back at the ranch story of Esther because she didn't return. And of, and of course, all those who were with her, Mordecai and, and the other Jewish people, they were among many of the Jewish people who, for different reasons, said, we're not going to go back. It was a small group. It was a remnant that had returned back to Jerusalem. Uh, but many had stayed, including Esther. And that's when, so the, the story of Esther is this tremendous threat against the Jewish people living in exile and, and what's going to happen and, and how's God going to act to preserve them. Yeah, um, and, and, and in that, you know, it's interesting. Meanwhile, back, I like the way you say that because you've kind of have in the biblical narrative, you know, the sort of tension between these two stories that are taking place. But God is showing how he's, how he's always working no matter where his people are. So Persia at this time, uh, uh, if I understand it right, had like four different capitals. Uh, you got about a minute and a half in this segment, maybe to just set the stage for that a little bit. Tell the audience a little bit about, about those places, if you would. Yes, so, I mean, normally you think of a, a, a kingdom as having a single capital. The uh, kingdom of Judah had Jerusalem, but, but Persia did, in fact, have four. And, and Susa, the one of, of interest to us most, uh, is the, was the winter capital, and that's because of the climate. It was so hot there that um, they didn't want to be there in the summer. Yeah. But the, uh, the, the, the most famous of the four capitals is Persepolis, the city of the Persians. But there's also um, Pasargade. There's also um, Ecbatana. That was actually inherited from the Medians. And as well as Babylon uh, was a, a capital out in, in the Mesopotamian plain. Okay, that's very good. So, you know, we, I guess Susa was referred to as the gateway to Persia. It's on the sort of the foothold, foothills of the Zagros Mountains, uh, you know, north of the Persian Gulf. So, you know, it's, it's not in that inner region of, of Iran, modern day Iran, um, but in a very accessible and warm place. So, all right, so that sets the stage for us, Todd, for, for the, uh, talking about the archeology. span And again, we've, we're gonna do this over two episodes. So in our next segment, we'll begin with that. And friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. I'm here with Dr. Todd Bowen. We're talking about Queen Esther and Susa, and we'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archeological field work and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures for students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth. I'm here with Dr. Todd Bowen. We're talking about Queen Esther in Susa in the Persian Empire and antiquity. Now, Todd, uh, we just kind of like uh, laid the foundation a little bit, just give people an idea of the time and the general geography of what, what we're talking about here. Uh, but, you know, now we're going to start talking about the archaeology, which is, uh, you know, even more fun. Uh, you know, there's been an extraordinary number of discoveries uh, found at Susa in particular. Uh, so let's let's begin there. Let's uh, start uh, taking people out to sea, as it were, with uh, how much we know about that. That's right. And those discoveries, so many of our viewers may be familiar with them, not because they've been to Iran, few people have, but because they're in the Louvre. And uh, just magnificent displays of the treasures from, from Susa. And that's because so the site of Susa was first identified in the middle of the 19th century, so around 1850. And, and they were able to identify it uh, because of the name. The name is preserved. This is so helpful uh, when we have these sites that have the same uh, ancient name preserved, maybe a little bit changed. It was the name of Shus, a, a little um, Persian village of Shush that preserves the, the biblical name in Hebrew is Shushan. We call it in English Susa. 
And uh, so then the French uh, got involved fully in 1885. And for almost a full century, there was some interruptions with the world wars, but, but otherwise they were digging, uh, you know, year after year, decade after decade until the revolution in 1979 and, and making, as you said, remarkable discoveries. You know, one of the uh, most famous one, people may not realize this, uh, is the Hammurabi Stella, which well, that was discovered at Susa. Now, it's not originally from there, and Haram, Hammurabi was a, a Babylonian king, but the people who lived in, in that area in Susa, the Elamites, had conquered Babylon and carried that, that uh, Stella off. And so that was one of the major discoveries, not, not related to, to Esther, that's some hundreds of years earlier, but, but they're digging there, and they, um, they built a, a very impressive archaeological base. So, you know, my first connection with the Associates for Biblical Research in the 90s, there when um, we were excavating at Hirbet al and that was the, the archaeological camp, as it were, their their home base was where the uh, Israel campus is for the Masters University. So we we connected there, and we would have meals together and lectures and all that. Well, the French, when they built at Susa, they didn't just you know have a few bungalows or like the Americans had this nice little camp at at Megiddo in in the 1920s and 30s. The French built a fortress. I mean, literally, it's a castle. In fact, uh, the <laughs> sign at the site says this is you know indubitably the most glorious archaeological base camp in the Near East, and it's it's really uh, Im- impressive. And now that sits on top of some of the ruins. Believe you know, of course, they built on top of some of the ancient remains, but it and it has this fantastic panoramic view of the area and it was a, a suitable base and they they felt they needed that protection from uh to you know defense from some of the uh, dangers of the area and protecting their equipment and their their people and but that's that base there is is going to serve their these excavations for this next century and the site is huge so you know when i take students around israel i said the biggest site is hot 200 acres well uh, that's nothing compared to Susa. I mean, Susa is 700 acres. Now, the archaeologists, I mean, that's just way too much for them to. So they were focusing on uh, certain areas of that. Right. There's in particular um, these three tells where they, they, they focus their energies. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great sketch. And it is large. You know, <laughs> I was thinking, man, you know, we, we dig at Shiloh now, right? We dug at McCotter, and you were there in the early days. I was going to mention that earlier. We got some photos of you from that to prove that, by the way. Uh, you know, like me back in the day when we both had more hair, right? But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, seriously, um, you know, we, we'll dig for a couple of years, and it's a lot of work just to publish reports for three or four years of excavation. The French were there for a century. The other thing that I thought was interesting was we always say archaeology is not Indiana Jones. But building a castle is a little bit more like that. Like you got to defend yourself from the local population. That's really extraordinary. Anyway, uh, any comments you want to make about the just the the length of time that they were there? Man, that's unbelievable. Well, that length of time allowed them to dig in different areas. So, you know, my real focus and and where we're going uh, with this episode and the next is uh, looking at the palace of Darius. But but they were uncovering remains from the Elamites. They're, those are, they're mentioned in the Bible. We don't think about them so much. Um, they dug this massive trench, uh, twenty years. I mean, think about it, digging for twenty years, digging down this trench and getting the history of the site. And so there's a lot of other interesting things that I mentioned already. The Hammurabi Stella, um, that uh, and then that, that that they found, in, as well as so much more that remains, you know, buried under the ground. Yeah. Now, now I'd li- like you to comment, this is a little bit different because you mentioned that you've been there. Now, a lot of people watching the show might be like, wait a minute, you're a Westerner and you were in Iran, are you nuts? But actually, uh, you had quite a positive experience. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, Todd. I did. I had really a wonderful experience in the Iranian people, very friendly, very welcoming. Uh, the, the simple, the procedure to get in, I mean, this might, you know, seem kind of strange, but it, it, it's really, really quite simple. We connected with a, a travel agency and built an itinerary. I mean, it was, we really, I built it from scratch. Uh, they don't do many biblical tours, but I said, I want to go to this site, this site, this site. And, and the government approved it and gave us visas. 
And we couldn't fly in, of course, directly from America. I went with a, a friend of mine uh, via another uh, city in the Middle East um, and landed there and had just a wonderful tour seeing just so much history that uh, otherwise I, I, I was frankly ignorant of. Yeah, that, that, that's a great story. It reminds me a little bit, too, of our own experience. You know, um, political realities are what they are, and that's the, that's the fallenness of man and the, the human story, and, and politics are part of human culture. Uh, but we also find, you know, when we dig in Israel, you know, uh, we meet a lot of people that are, uh, they call themselves Palestinians or Arabs or different backgrounds, and they're just wonderful people. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had people at, at Makata, you know, bring us out tea and lunch and, and all that. You got about 30 seconds. Maybe comment on that a little bit more. We don't often talk about the cultural experience here on our show. Absolutely. And, you know, it's really easy in our fallenness to have, uh, you know, mistaken perceptions of people or stereotypes and to kind of, you know, paint everybody into, you know, uh, one per person of a particular nationality. Is, is a suicide bomber or whatever we kind of you know think well that must be every all of them or you know the in the country of iran or, you know there's of course great difficulties there and and real concern uh, to be sure but but among the people there just had just nothing but encouragement friendly words great conversation and uh, uh just a, a real interest in being friends with Americans. Oh, that's great. Well, all right, so we're gonna be moving on again here a little bit further now with the archeology span and friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. I'm here with Todd Bowen. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith and I'm here with Dr. Todd Bowen. We're talking about Queen Esther in Susa in the Persian Empire in the Bible. All right, so Todd, you were talking a little bit about your experience going, actually going to Iran to look at some of these sites. You went to Susa, but there's other places that you visited that are significant in terms of the broader picture of the Persian Empire. Why don't you start uh, sharing some of that with us, please? Well, the most famous city, the one that people would be most familiar with in pictures and everything are the, the remains of Persepolis, which, which literally means in Greek, the city of the Persians. And it's fabulous. The, so by contrast with Susa, so when we see Susa, we're seeing mud bricks, not preserved very high, but, but Persepolis is made out of rock and, and the beautiful reliefs that that graced the the palace of Darius, and in fact, uh, you know, I've been taking pictures of a lot of places for many years, but I've never taken more pictures in one day at one place than I did that day that I was at Persepolis, and just phenomenal preservation of reliefs from from the time of Esther, from 500 B.C. Another uh, important stop for us, just down the road was the capital city of, of Cyrus, Pasargade, which um, is, is uh, you know, he made it his capital, and, and his tomb is, is famous there. But there, there's more than the tomb. There's some palaces, there's inscriptions that have his name. And, and, and listeners who are thinking about Cyrus, I mean, they're connecting him right now to the decree to allow the Jewish people to return. So Jeremiah had said 70 years of exile, and and Isaiah said it's going to be Cyrus who says they can go back and prophesied 150 years in advance by name, Cyrus. And, and it came to pass. We see that in, in the, the last words of Second Chronicles, the beginning of Ezra, where Cyrus says they can go back. Well, we have his hometown and, and, and his tomb. And uh, it's very, very famous 
today in Iran. And a lot of tourists there when, when I was visiting, not foreign, but Iranians, because they so revere the, their great ancestor, their great forebear Cyrus and his policies of toleration, tolerance that that um, allowed, among among others, the Jewish people to return. And, and another place that we saw that's not directly connected to the Bible, but really unlocked the key to so much of the Bible is the Behistun inscription, which is located far north of the country, up in the mountains. And this, you can equate this with the, the Rosetta Stone. In fact, it's been called the Rosetta Stone of the East. This uh, relief depicts Darius, the great, coming to the throne. But what makes it so valuable for scholars is that the, the inscription is in three languages. So we have the old Persian, as, as well as the Elamite and the Akkadian. So they, they were able to crack the code of these yeah. other languages and thereby you know, understand the, uh, so much of the ancient history of the biblical world. Yeah, that inscription is the archaeologist slash linguist dream uh, because it helps us decipher ancient text. I should mention for the benefit of our audience, we do have episodes on Cyrus and Xerxes, like biographies that we've done in the past. We'll put up that information on the screen. Now, what we want to do is circle back around now to Susa because we're going to finish this, this episode talking a little bit about some of the archaeology and then the next episode talking about a lot of it related to Esther. So um, let's, let's set the stage a little bit. You mentioned that the city was 700 acres in size. Perhaps uh, give us a little more on that, the citadel and, and so on. That's right. So this huge city, uh, capital, one of the four capitals, of the Persians, the winter capital of Darius. And now let me connect Darius. So Darius is the father of Xerxes, uh, who is also known as in, in Hebrew as Ahasuerus. And so he's Esther's father-in-law. He's the one who establishes this as a Persian capital, and he's the one who builds this massive palace. Now that's only part of the city. That's about his palace uh, areas around 35 acres. But, so in addition to that, there is uh, the uh, so-called Acropolis, there is the Via Royale, and there's the Via of the Artisans. And now here's, this is a beautiful thing. The archaeologists uh, identified there's a, the royal area, the uh, elevated area that's kind of set apart, more fortified, where the administration was, the Persian uh, uh, king in his palace. And, and then there's another part of the city that was for the residents, for the you know average people, you could say. And this division is reflected in the book of Esther. So there's a number of references in the book of Esther to the citadel of Susa. And there's a bunch of other references in the book of Esther to the city of Susa. The author got it right. I mean, the author understood the citadel, that's the royal center where the palace compound is, and the city, that's where the, the people actually, the verse where you can see this best is in Esther 3.15. Uh, it says, the couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. So there's that distinction. And again, as I said, if you track throughout the book, uh, about 10 times or so where it mentions the citadel and, and about another 10, nine or 10 times where it mentions the city. And that's speaking to those different areas of the city that archaeology is exposed. Yeah. And, and again, uh, uh, for folks who have watched our program, they know that we emphasize the, the nature of eyewitness testimony. The people places that the people were there witnessing these things and the distinctions are found in the biblical text. Todd, we got about 45 seconds to wrap up uh, this episode. If you could do that for us, just give us a, a summary and then maybe, or maybe a taste of what's in the next episode. That'd be better. You can go to Susa today and stand in the palace and you can walk from the women's quarters to the throne room where Xerxes Ahasuerus was sitting with his scepter. And Esther came to approach him and waiting to see, is he going to hold out his scepter to me so she can make the request yes. right, to save the lives of her people? Yeah. You can go there. 
and we'll talk about that in the next episode. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Well, thank you, Todd, for, for joining us for this episode. We'll be uh, back with you for the next one. I so appreciate what you do. And friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We're glad that you were with us today. We were talking about Esther and Susa. We were just laying a foundation for our next episode. We hope that you'll come back and watch that one with us as well. And thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. <laughs>